Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Sunshine. Chapter 25. I nodded, probably too vigorously, because his smile faded. Something wrong? Nothing that wasn't wrong the last time you asked me that question, I thought, only it's got wronger faster than maybe I was expecting. I shook my head, trying to be less vigorous. No. Thanks. He swallowed the last of his coffee, put the mug down on the ground, and came over to me. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I put my arms around him, leaned my face against his shoulder, my forehead against the oak tree that was visible beneath the torn-off sleeve of his t-shirt, and sighed. He smelled of food and daylight. I could feel his heart beating. He put his arms around me. Probably just lingering indigestion from eleven twelfths of a bitter chocolate death yesterday, I said. I felt the small kick of his diaphragm as he laughed. He had a sort of furry chuckle laugh, but he knew me too well. Try again. Sunshine, he said. Do blue whales od guzzling all that sea water? Your veins run chocolate, finest dark semi-sweet, not blood. Pity it looked red, then. It gave vampires ideas. I didn't say anything. You can tell me about it on Friday, okay? He said. I nodded. Okay. If I said any more, I would probably burst into tears. I drove home slowly. I thought of going by the library, but decided Emil came into the too difficult category, and she might conceivably make some kind of guess what I was feeling so gloomy about, and I didn't want to take the risk. What a really awful reason not to see someone for the last time. But I was so tired. I sat in the car again at home and watched the leaves turning. It seemed to me a lot of autumn had happened in the last two days. I thought of the two days out of time I'd had after Con had diagnosed me and before he was supposed to come back and cure me. I'd known I was dying, but it kind of hadn't mattered. It wasn't only that I believed Con would find a way to heal me. It was that there wasn't anything I could do. I didn't have that luxury this time. I was going to have to go through with it, whatever it was. I'd always scorned the stories where the princesses hung around waiting to be rescued. Sleeping beauty, spare me. Tell the stupid little wasp to wake up and sort out the wicked fairy herself. I found myself thinking that sleeping through it sounded pretty good after all. Yolanda was looking out for me, and her door was open before I'd climbed out of the wreck. I walked draggingly up to her. I didn't even know that it was going to be tonight. I remembered those extra nights I'd waited for Con, with death lying on my breast like a lover. What a long time ago that seemed. I tried to make this a hopeful thought, but it refused to work. It was like trying to blow up a popped balloon. Hello, death, you again. Just can't keep away, can you? Saints and damnation. Mostly damnation. Yolanda drew me into her workroom. There was a little heap of 
sunlight on her desk. What? I blinked. It looked like, as if there was a chink in the blind, letting a single ray in to make a pool there, except it wasn't a pool, it was a heap, and there was no ray of sun. I could feel my eyes fizzing back and forth like a camera's automatic lens, trying to find the right setting and failing. The heap cast no shadows. It was a small domed hummock of pure golden light. I had stopped to stare, and Yolanda went to her desk and picked it up. It seemed to flow over her hands, slowly, like rivulets of warm honey, or small friendly sleepy snakes. It was, I thought, as it separated itself over her fingers, a latticework of some variety. The filaments met and parted in some kind of pattern, and the filaments themselves seemed to carry a pattern, like scales on a snake's back. It moved slowly, but it moved. It curled round Yolanda's wrists. My strange sense of it, them being friendly but half asleep, remained. It will wake up when it touches you, she said, as if reading my mind. We had to put it together in great haste, and it's not yet used to being manifest. She came toward me stretching the light net gently between her hands like a cat's cradle, and threw it over me. For a moment I was surrounded by twinkling lights, and then I felt it, them, settling gently against my skin, delicate as snowflakes, but warm. Bemusedly I held one arm out to watch the process. You know how if you watch, if you concentrate, you can feel when snowflakes land on you, feel the chill of them, almost individually at first, till your face or hand or arm begins to numb with the cold, and then they melt against your skin and disappear. So it was with these tiny light flakes, I saw them as they floated down, shimmering down, felt them when they touched me, lighter than feathers or gossamer, and over all of me for clothes were insubstantial to them. But they were not merely warm, a few of them were uncomfortably hot, and left tiny pinprick red marks, and while they dissolved on contact like snowflakes, they appeared to sink through the surface of my skin, leaving nothing behind, no dampness, no stickiness, no shed scales. After they'd all vanished, if I turned my arm sharply back and forth I could just see the webwork of light, like veins, only golden, not blue. I itched faintly, especially where belt and bra straps rubbed. Yolanda let out a long slow breath. I looked at her inquiringly. I wasn't sure it was going to work. I told you we had to put this together very quickly. What is it? Yolanda paused. I'm not sure how to explain it to you. It is not a ward, or only indirectly so. It is a form of come hither, but generally only sorcerers ever use anything like it. It, it gathers your strength to you. It taps into the source of your strength, more strongly than you can unaided. Most magic handlers have a talent for one thing or another, and it is drawn from one area of this world or another. A foreseer with a principal rapport with trees may see visions in a bell of her favorite wood, for example, rather than in the traditional crystal ball. A sorcerer whose strongest relationship is with water will be much likelier to drown his or her enemy than to meet them in battle, although one with an affinity for metal would forge a sword. Affinity, 
I said bitterly. My affinity is for vampires. No, said Yolanda. Why do you say that? Pat. S.O.F. That's why they want me. Because I'm a M magic handler, I could hardly get the phrase out. Handling seemed far from the correct term in my case, with an affinity for vampires. Yolanda shook her head. The hierarchies of magic handling are no particular study of mine. But your principal affinity is for sunlight, your element, as it were. It is usually one of the standard four, earth, air, water, fire. Sometimes it is metal, sometimes wood. I have never heard of one for sunlight before, but there are our tests for these things. Yours is neither fire nor air but a bit of both, and something else. While I was doing the tests and coming up nowhere, I thought of sunlight because of all the days I have seen you lying in the sun like a cat or a dog, I have only ever seen you truly relaxed like that, lying motionless in sunlight. And you told me once about the year you were ill, when you lived in a basement flat, and how you cured yourself by lying in front or the sunny windows when you moved upstairs. I thought of your nickname, how I myself had relied on your nickname to tell me the real truth about you, after the vampire visited you. As for your let us call it counter-affinity, your counter-affinity may be for vampires. I have never heard of this either but I do know it is often a magic handler with a principal affinity for water who can cross a desert most easily, a handler with a principal affinity for air who can hold her breath the longest, someone with an affinity for earth who flies most easily. It is the strength of the element in you that makes you more able to resist and simultaneously embrace its opposite. You are not consumed by the dark because you are full of light. I didn't feel full of light. I felt full of stomach acid and cold phlegm. I knew about the four elements, of course, I even knew a little about this counter-affinity thing. Magic handlers with a principal fire element never get hired by the fire service. Fires tend to be harder to put out with them around. But an air or a water is a shoe-in for the fire core because airs never seem to suffer smoke inhalation and water seems to go farther with the water. A lot of lives have been saved by the airs and the waters in the fire core. I'd never thought of it as having to do with counter-affinities though. But then I had never thought a lot about magic handling. I had always been too busy being fascinated by stories of the others. I can see in the dark, uh, now, I said, not wanting to get into how it happened, but it makes me kind of nuts. In the dark it's okay. But I see in through the shadows in daylight too but I see through them, strangely. I mostly can't make sense of what I'm seeing. Or if I can I don't know if I'm imagining it, to make it make sense. And most of them wiggle. Yolanda looked interested. Perhaps you will tell me more about that sometime. I may be able to help. Sometime. I thought. Yeah. The shadows on you don't wiggle though. They just lie there, like all shadows used to. Ah. That will perhaps be the purification process of wards keeping. If you become a master, as I eventually did, 
You go through a series of trials that are to make you what you are as intensely as possible. You would not be able to do what a master does without this. I imagine you will see other masters of their craft as you see me. I still hadn't decided if the shadows that fell on Con moved around or not. Dark shadows were different from light shadows. So to speak. If they didn't, did that make him a master vampire? What is a master vampire? SOF used the term for someone who ran a gang. I held both arms out and admired the faint twinkly gold, felt the faint prickly itch. I pulled a handful of my hair forward where I could look at it and it too was laced and daubed with gold. Maybe Yolanda could sell the process to a hairdresser, bet you didn't have to touch it up every few weeks. Pity I wouldn't be around to demonstrate. The sun was near setting. I dropped my arms. Thank you, I said. That is so feeble. But thank you very much. You're very welcome, my dear, said Yolanda. I must go now, I think. Yes. But I hope you will come back and tell me about it. I met her eyes and saw with a shock that she did know. I tried to smile. I hope I will too. I sat just inside the open doors of the balcony, cross-legged, hands on knees. I didn't bother to try to align to ask him anything, to tell him anything. He would be here soon enough. He would be here. This time what was doomed to happen wasn't going to be put off. It would begin tonight. And, probably, end there too. The sun reddened the autumn colours on the trees. The shadows darkened and lengthened. Part 4 Perhaps the flakes of light had settled in my eyes too when Yolanda's web had fallen around me. Sitting still and waiting, watching the sun set, I hadn't thought much about the way the shadows fell and moved, it was always easier when I was motionless myself. But I saw him clearly this time. I saw him, and not merely by a process of elimination, one wiggly shadow moving in a specific direction. He was a dark figure, human-shaped. Vampire-shaped. He was con. A dark figure, dark with glints of gold, as if light flakes fell on him, sparked like struck matches and fell away. Did I hear him or not? I don't know. I had a feeling like sound of him, as I had a feeling like sight. I saw him disappear around the corner of the house. He would be coming up the stairs now, I felt his presence there. He would be opening my door home, did he open doors to walk through them? No, wait. Vampires couldn't disintegrate themselves, I didn't think. A few sorcerers could, but they were the really crazy ones. If you've invited a vampire across your threshold, maybe the door simply didn't exist for him anymore. Or anyway why did the front door always whoosh gently when I opened it but not when he did? And I knew when he was standing behind me. It wasn't that I heard him breathing. But the vampire in the room thing was unmistakable. I stood up and turned around. He looked different. 
It might have been the light flakes but I don't think so. I probably look different too. If you're going into what you know is your final battle maybe the preliminary loin girding always is visible. My experience is limited. I don't know that I would necessarily have identified the way Con looked as a vampire prepared for his last battle, but as a thumbnail description it would do. I was always surprised at how big he was. That's probably something about the way vampires move, the boneless gliding, that human spine unhinging creepy grace. You didn't believe it, so you made the vampire smaller in your memory to make it a little more plausible. Ah. I don't know about the generic you in this case. So far as I knew I was the only human, so far, who'd had the opportunity. Or the need. It's funny, vampires have been a fact of human existence since before history began, and yet in our heart of hearts I don't think we really believe in them. Every time one of us meets up with one of them we don't believe in them all over again. Of course in most cases a human meeting up with a vampire is looking at their immediate death and so not believing it is the last forlorn hope, but I'm here to say that being acquainted with one doesn't lessen the feeling much. I didn't believe in Con. Tricky. I believed in my own death more. I stretched my hand out and put it on his chest, where no heart beat. He was wearing another one of his long black shirts. It might have been the one I had worn a few nights ago, except that that one was hanging in the back of my closet with the cranberry red dress. My vampire wardrobe. I let my hand drop. But he reached out and picked it up. There was a phase, a shock, as his skin met mine. I felt him twitch ever so slightly, but he didn't loose my hand. He turned it over instead, and then laid it gently, as if it had no volition of its own, in the palm of his other hand. The invisible spark happened again, but he didn't startle this time. My back was to the fading twilight, but in the shadow of my body the occasional gold glints of the web were just visible. What is this? he said. Yolanda gave it to me. She said it would help me draw on the source of my strength. Daylight, he said. Yes. Does it hurt you? No. I thought about that no. It sounded a little like the no of the kid playing so-called touch football who has just had the three biggest kids in the neighborhood tag her by knocking her down and sitting on her. They asked me after they let me up if I was hurt. I said no. I was lying. Let me rephrase that. A small shiver in his breath. Really quite a human noise, audible breath with a catch in it, like a muted laugh. When you are a little too hot, a little too cold, does it hurt? Old Mr. Temperature Control, I thought. What do you know about too hot and too cold? No, I still wasn't thinking about any of that. Delete that thought. Or if you pick up something a little too heavy for you, does it hurt? It is only a little pressure on the understood boundaries of yourself. I like that, a little pressure on the understood boundaries of yourself. Sounded like something out of a self-awareness class, probably with yoga. 
See what kind of a pretzel you can tie yourself into and press on the understood. I was raving, if only to myself. I took a deep breath. Okay. My new lightweb was to con no worse than hauling an overfull sheet of cinnamon rolls out of the oven and making a run for the countertop before I dropped them was to me. I looked into his face, dully lit by the last of the twilight, and realized, with a shock, that I had no doubt, the shadows there lay quietly too. Ready, he said. I smiled involuntarily. Are you joking? Yes, I said. I have taken what you showed me and measured it by the ways I know. I believe that between us we shall attain our goal. Our goal, I thought. I didn't translate this into practical terms. We do not travel in your now Harrisville, but I fear the way we are going is nonetheless unpleasant. I will need your assistance. It will not be easy both to travel that way and to guard our presence from too early detection. I closed my eyes hurling myself into this, to stop myself from thinking about it, took a firmer grip on his hand and began to search for the alignment. This was very different from the fuzzy non-telephone line I had used to talk to Con, for that I could just go to the edge of whatever it was that was out there, and grope. This was more like walking through a snake pit with a forked stick, hoping you could sneak up behind the snake you wanted and nail it with the stick before it nailed you. Meanwhile hoping that none of the other snakes saw you first. I glanced apologetically at the ever so slightly like the back of a snake pattern glinting faint gold against in my skin. I said one of my grand's words, it was only a little word, a little word of thanks and of settling, settling down, settling in but I thought the light web might like it. Then I closed my eyes again. There. This may have been the light web too, or it may have been that I'd now done my compass needle maneuver several times and was getting the hang of it, or it may have been con. Some of it was con, I could feel the faint scritchy buzz of connection through our palms. There seemed to be a variety of paths laid out before us. There was the totally evisceratingly worst, the slightly less worst but worst enough, the still really bad, the only basic deadly dire, and probably a few others. I was looking at the Catherine Wheel glitter of the way that had blown out Sof HQ and at the looming thing that was our destination as Con arranged us on the boundary of one of the other, the quite awful enough thanks ways. The looming thing and its guardians didn't look so much like an aquarium this time or if it did, those fish were sick, more like the special effects in one of those post-Holocaust movies. Any moment now the ghastly mutants would come lurching on screen and wave their deviant limbs at us. I wished it was a movie. Come, said Con, and we stepped forward together. By the time we'd walked off the edge of the balcony we were firmly, if that's quite the word I want, into other space. Vampires probably can bound lightly down from third stories, but I didn't want to try it. As it was I was immediately having a precarious time keeping my feet, there didn't seem to be any up or down although this is a good thing when you've just walked off a balcony or sideways or backward or forward for that matter, other than the fact that we had backs and fronts and our faces were on one side of us rather than another. This path, 
whatever it was, was a lot worse than Con's short way home the other night. At least I had feet, which was an improvement on now her Esville. Hey, not only did I have feet, I got to keep my clothes on. I could still see the looming thing that was what we were aiming for, and since I didn't know anything about the protective detail I assumed that my function was to keep watching it. Con propelled us. Presumably forward. He seemed to know up from down and sideways from sideways. I felt things was past me occasionally, and while I couldn't TV told you what they were, I could guess they weren't friendly. Every time I set my foot down it seemed to resolve the place I was in a little more, as if my invading three-dimensionality was making my surroundings coagulate, and little by little there seemed to be another sort of stepping stone system after all. Although rather than the ordinary world sluicing by between the stones it seemed to boil up, and become part of the no up no down no anything else. I felt as if I would like to be sick, but fortunately my stomach couldn't figure out which was up either, so it stayed where it was. After some kind of time there began to be half-recognizable ordinary things in the careening entropy. A street lamp. A corner of a dilapidated building with a revolving door, one of whose panes was broken. A stop sign. A road sign. Garrison Street. We were in no town. As we went on, on still used advisedly, we flickered more clearly into no town. Sometimes we took a step or two on broken pavement as if we were actually there. Maybe we were. There were now other people sporadically present also. I didn't like the look of any of them. We passed several nightclubs with people wandering in and out. There were bouncers at the doors of some of them but that mostly wasn't the style in no town. If you could walk, you could walk where you wanted to. Even the seriously flash Spartan clubs, the places where people who lived in downtown high-rises went when they wanted to feel like they were slumming but were still willing to pay 30 blinks for a short glass of wine to prove they were slumming only because they wanted to, had more subtle ways of getting rid of you. Meanwhile, outdoors, if you fell down, you lay there, and people still ambulatory stepped over you. Horizontal bodies were part of the ambience. Maybe you got rolled, while you were lying there being ambient. Maybe you got taken home for dinner. To be dinner. It wasn't a good place to linger in for anyone anyone alive. That is but there was another myth, that if you were high enough, the suckers would leave you alone, because your blood would screw them up. I don't think this is something I'd want to rely on myself. There are ne'er-do-wells among the others like there are among us humans, and my guess is there are suckers who have developed a taste for screwed up blood. Also, if you're hungry enough, You'll eat anything, right? And a still breathing body face down in a gutter is real easy to, you know, catch. I was having trouble staying upright as we winked back and forth between worlds. If when visible I was staggering a little, I would fit right in. I was a little afraid I might see someone I knew. Gods and angels never underestimate the power of social conditioning, even under the circumstances, when I was fully expecting never having to face or explain anything to anyone again after the next few minutes or hours or time fragments splintered by chaos space, I was worried about this, that I might see Kenny, or his friends, 
or some of the younger, dumber regulars at Charlie's, or even what remained of a few of the guys my age I knew who hadn't got back out of drugs again. What was I afraid of? That they might see me too holding hands with a vampire. That I would look as if I was merely under the dark and going to the usual fate of a human scene in the company of a vampire. I was supposed to care. I didn't know what any humans might be making of us. But I began to see vampires looking back at us. I didn't have any trouble recognizing them. I didn't know if this was because they weren't bothering to try to pass, or if I just knew a vampire when I saw one these days. I didn't notice when the first one did more than look, when the first one came at us. I didn't notice till Con had, never mind. He did it with his other hand, and with the hand that held mine, jerked us back into chaos space. He wiped the splatter of blood off his face with his forearm, except there was blood on his arm too. I was afraid I'd see him lick his lips. I didn't. Maybe I didn't watch long enough. Maybe, you know, used blood isn't of much interest. My hand trembled in his, in the hand of my lethal vampire companion. I was alive, human, with a beating heart. I was all alone. The next time there were several of them. This time Con jerked us out of chaos space, because he then had to let go of my hand. I was glad I didn't have to find out what would happen if I got left there alone without him. I wasn't glad for very long. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, note to myself, in my next life, get some martial arts training, get a lot of martial arts training, just in case. Again, as with the first vampire who attacked us, something happened quicker than I could follow, quicker than I wanted to follow, and I yanked my gaze away, afraid of what my dark vision might make out for me. There was blood, again, but there was also at least one vampire left over while Con was otherwise engaged, and he was looking at me. I looked at him, not thinking about anything but my own terror, my eyes wide open, open so wide that they hurt. He met that gaze, hey, he knew a human when he saw one, and he knew he was a vampire, and I saw him falter and then Con had turned from whatever he was doing and took care of that one too, too fast for me to look away. I think I probably cried out. Jesse wasn't going to rescue me, this time. I wasn't going to come to myself with human arms around me and a human voice shouting in my ear, it's all over. You're all right. Sunshine. Chapter 26. There was now quite a lot of blood, and, bits and pieces. I had blood on me too. Con seized my hand again, and said sharply, come. I didn't dare look in his face. There would be no comfort, no reassurance, in the face of any vampire. When I took a running step to keep up with him, my shoe slipped. In the blood. There was so much blood on our hands that as it dried, our fingers stuck together. The meaty smell was a miasma, a poison gas. We didn't duck back into the chaos space. I had half forgotten my alignment, but it was now as if it was tied to me or I was tied to it. It was pulling us along, through these dark broken streets where the shadows lay twisted and crumpled like dead bodies, 
pulling as if we were on a leash. I wanted to untie it, but I couldn't, I mustn't I wanted to know, it was too late, even if I had funked it now, at the last minute, after the last minute, all it would do now is get us killed. Sooner. I could hear them, someone, keeping pace with us, why didn't they close in, cut us off, attack us? Con said quietly, as if there was no urgency whatsoever, Bo will not be able to say your name. Either of your names. What? Sunshine. Ray Daylight names. Old vampires can't say daylight words either. The very old vampires that can't go out in the moonlight that is only faint reflected sunlight. The academics would have said Con counted as very old, and he didn't even wait for full dark. Twilight was good enough for him. And he called me sunshine. There are different ways of being what we are. Apparently Bo hadn't aged so well. Something to talk to the academics about. Variability of aging among vampires. Usage of certain words pertaining to daylight by aged vampires. Maybe I could get my pass into the other museum's library after all. No, wait. I was about to die. I didn't immediately see what good Bo's not being able to say my name was going to do me. Bo wasn't going to need to say or know my name to kill me. Okay. Names are power. We'd had that back at the lake. Big deal. Fangs are more power. We'd had that at the lake too. Con had chosen to let me go. Bo wasn't going to. Why had I agreed to this anyway? You feel the pull strongly. Con went on in that infuriatingly calm voice. Bo has connected to our presence here. If we are separated, go on. Follow that connection to its end. Leave me. I will catch up with you when I can. Oh good. I was so glad he would make the effort to catch up with me later. Although I wished he'd used the word goal or aim rather than end. I recommend, he added, dispassionate as ever, I was trying to remind myself that he always sounded unbothered, not to say dead. Or maybe that it was a good sign he sounded so unflapped now, as if this was still all part of the normal range of vampire activities. I almost didn't hear the rest of what he was saying, you do not attempt to retreat into any other space, including the way I have brought us both. You would only draw some of Bo's creatures after you, and their advantage there would be greater than yours. Right. Like it wasn't greater than mine everywhere. I realized that while we were no longer in the chaos space, we weren't exactly in no town either. Or at least I hoped it wasn't no town, because if it was, our human world was in even more trouble than most of us knew about, than I knew about, again the thought came to me, what did I know? Pat said a hundred years, tops, before, and the people who came to no town for thrills weren't likely to notice that the whole scene was sliding over the edge of normal reality into. I felt the pull strongly all right, like a hand around my throat that was slowly tightening. If I was a dog on a lead, I was wearing a choke collar, and my master didn't like me much. Maybe it was that sense of pressure that made my vision go funny, but then, 
My vision had been funny for two months now, and I was kind of used to funniness. But this was a new kind of funniness, where things seemed to dance in and out of existence, rather than merely in and out of light and darkness. There were streetlights where we were, some of them still worked, and great swathes of darkness. There was the uneven pavement under our feet, the potholed roads, the crumbling curbs. Once I stepped unawares on a manhole cover and the sound this made, even in this night of horrors, made my heart leap into my throat. There were tall buildings that seemed to prowl among the shadows, a few of them had dim lights burning that gave the old peeling posters on their walls an undesirable life, huge painted eyes winked at me, fingers as long as my legs beckoned to me. The way the clubs leaped out of the night with their noise and bewildering lighting, stabbing and erratic, rhythmic and dazzling, rainbow-colored all this week's fashion match, heightened that sense of otherwhere. Hey, I wanted to say to some of the humans we passed, you don't need drugs, let me tell you. There are spaces between worlds, there are master vampires that loop invisible ropes around your neck and drag you to your doom. We are running through no town. I hear our footsteps, no, I hear my footsteps, and the kind of unmatched echo that chills your blood, because you know it means you're not alone, and what you're not alone with isn't human. I remember when hearing and seeing were simple, it had to do with sound and light and the manageable equations they taught you in school. I am wondering if anyone notices us, the only kind of running that goes on here is the furtive kind, no joggers out to burn off last night's burger and fries or reach the buzz of an endorphin high. No one, hearing running footsteps, especially running footsteps with an unmatched echo, is going to look up if they can help it. I guess I can stop worrying about seeing someone I know. A few people do look up, though, bad consciences, old habits, a momentary or drug-induced forgetfulness about who or where they are. I think I meet the eyes of one young woman, I see her take me in, take Con in, disbelieve us both, and then we're past her, running out of the light surf, back into the ocean of darkness into a fresh sea of vampires. They didn't want to connect with me. Lucky me. I winced and twitched out of the way of anything I saw, anything I half saw. I stopped trying to see anything, and let my instinct, whatever instinct this was, keep me moving. Where was Con? No, I still knew him from the rest of them. For one thing, he was the center of the sea. If there's only one guy on your team, he's the one everybody else is jumping on. It went on in a horrible almost silence. There was a hot circlet around my neck and across my breast. There were two small fires burning in my two front jeans pockets. Apparently they'd learned their lesson that first time, when the sun's word had hit the pillow, they didn't set my clothes on fire this time either. And it wasn't because they weren't really putting it out, they were. The evening we'd blown soft HQ wasn't even a dress rehearsal for what was going on now. Even with my talismans going full throttle my luck didn't hold for long. Something, someone, crashed into me, tore me away from Con, out of the sea, it was taking me somewhere. It was, in fact, the same direction I was being dragged by my invisible leash, but I didn't feel I wanted any help getting there sooner, besides, 
Whatever Con had said about going on without him, I'd rather not. Thanks. I saw a shape and ducked away from it. It seemed a little uncertain of its own bearings, it missed its grab, and teeth ground down my arm, strangely fumbling, if teeth can fumble. Hey, my jugular is up this way. I wished for a nice apple tree steak, well impregnated with mistletoe, except I didn't know how to use it, staking takes training. The table knife had been a one-off, I put my right hand in my pocket, braced the butt end of my hot little knife against my palm, and pointed it up between my fingers, not with the blade open, just the hard blunt end of it like a single fat brass knuckle. I saw it momentarily, shining like a tiny moon, like a slightly misaligned gemstone in a ring. Then I swung it, with my paltry human strength, up in the general direction of where the base of the breastbone that belonged to the teeth in my other arm might be. I connected. The wide blunt end of my knife sank in. As it did it blazed up, no longer moonlike but sunlike, golden, shining, a tongue of flame, and in its light I saw a golden lattice extending up my arm. I had just time to remember what had happened in an alley when I had used a table knife. The noise was different. There were no narrow alley walls for the gobbets to smack against. Instead I heard the thick heavy splat, like loathsome rain, as they fell around me. I'd forgotten the smell, the smell of something long dead and rotten. I thought, they're not even a little human anymore when they explode. They shatter so easily, like throwing an overripe melon against a fence. No melon ever smelled like this. Con rematerialized from wherever he had been, from whatever he had been doing. I just managed not to wince out of his way too. The problem was he looked like a vampire, and at the moment he looked a lot more like a vampire than he looked like Con. One of the even more comforting than usual stories about vampires is that sometimes, during vampire gang wars for example, they go into berserker furies and tear anything they can get their hands on apart not only their enemies but their comrades, the guys on their own side. Supposedly the berserker fit can last quite a while, and if a particularly effective dismemberer gets to the end of the bodies around it before the fit wears off, it will tear itself to shreds too. Maybe this is a consoling story when you're at home with a book or reading it off your combox screen. The idea that there are that many fewer vampires in the world, that they had done each other in while we humans cowered safely behind closed doors with a hell of a lot of wards nailed over them. If you find yourself so unlucky as to be living somewhere there is a sucker gang war going on, you pin a lot of wards around your house and you do not go out after dark or before dawn for any reason. I didn't know what a vampire running amok looked like, but it might have looked like Con. It wasn't just, it wasn't, look, if you ever have the opportunity to choose between being eaten by a tiger and bitten by an enraged vampire, take the tiger. I was probably off in my feeble little human she's in chocrapa in a blanket and get out the whiskey space. Humans don't deal with extreme situations very well. Our pathetic bodies freak out. We freeze, and our blood pressure falls, and we can't think, and all that. I stood there, staring while Con snarled and showed me his teeth, 
and didn't offer me the blanket or the whiskey or the hot sweet tea. Then maybe he remembered I was his ally, maybe he'd remembered that but had momentarily forgotten, seeing me as soaked in blood and sprinkled with the remains of a mutilated enemy as he, that I was a mere human. Maybe the snarl was the vampire equivalent of hot damn. Well done. Whatever. He stopped snarling, and, drew his face together. When he seized my slimy hand and pulled me along after him again I didn't gibber, I didn't collapse, and I didn't throw up. I stuffed my knife back into my pocket, and went. I wish I could forget how it feels, your hair stuck to your skull with blood, foul blood running gummily down inside your clothes, invading your privacy, your decency, your humanity, till it chafes you with every breath, every movement, the tug of it as it dries on your skin feeling like some kind of snare. Blood in your mouth, that you cannot spit the vile taste of away. I think I must have gone into some kind of berserker fury myself. There are things you don't want to know you can do, aren't there? But if you're lucky you never find them out. I found out too many of them, all at once. I, who had to leave the kitchen at Charlie's when they were whacking up meat into joints or putting slabs of drippy pulpy maroony red stuff through the grinder. Blood stings when it gets in your eyes. And it's viscous, so it's hard to blink out again. It may not only be because the blood stings that you're weeping. I have always been afraid of more things than I can remember at one time. Mom, when I was younger, and still admitted to some of them, said that it was the price of having a good imagination and suggested I stop reading the Blood Law series, which was past thirty volumes even then, and maybe retiring Immortal Death and Below Hell Keep from the top bookshelf for a while. I didn't, but it wouldn't have done any good if I had. Reading scary books is weirdly reassuring, most of the time. It means at least one other person, the author has imagined things as awful as you have. What's bad is when the author comes up with stuff you hadn't thought of yet. I'd thought it was bad when I was just reading stuff I hadn't thought of. And even then I'd known that sometimes it's worse when the author leaves it to your imagination. I stopped using my knife. I found out I didn't have to. I found out I could do it with my hands. It was still mostly con, that we got through. Even warded up the wazoo and covered in bright gold cobweb I was still only human. I was still slower and weaker than any vampire. But I had con. And I was warded and webbed, and the vampires didn't like tangling with me. They kept choosing to tangle with Con, even though they could see, graphically, what had happened to the last vampire or 12 or 27 or 4008 vampires that had tangled with Con. If we ever got to the end of all this, ha ha and so on, and wanted to find our way back out of the maze, it wasn't a thread we would have to follow but a path paved with undead body parts. Maybe they thought they'd wear him out or something. I still got a few. You'd think offing a few vampires would feel like doing a community service, wouldn't you? It doesn't. Not even when they don't explode. That's why I started doing it with my hands. They didn't explode, I discovered, if I merely jammed my fingers in under their breastbones and pulled. 
My vampire affinity. I lost track. There was gore and gruesomeness and then more of it and I hated all of it, and was ready to be killed, just to get away from it, if someone would promise me, cross their heart and hope to die, very very funny, that I wouldn't rise again. In any semblance. I still wasn't sure about the mechanics of turning and it seemed to me that dying in the present circumstances probably wasn't the best recipe for staying quietly in my grave afterward. Supposing someone found enough of me to bury. I would have liked to give up. I meant to give up. But I couldn't. Like I couldn't stay at home and hide under the bed. I guess. Maybe it was promising Con to stick around as long as I could. Stick seemed the right verb under the circumstances. Every time I lifted one of my blood clotted shoes there was a sticky, ripping noise. And then everything went quiet, at least except for the noise I was making. Mostly it was just breathing. Maybe bleating a little. One of the things that had happened during the business of savaging our way through Bo's army was that I'd begun to know where Con was, like I knew where my right hand or my left leg was. It was a bit like unwrapping something from swathes of tissue paper, or following an idea through its development to a conclusion. You have an inkling of something some shape or concept, and it gets clearer and stronger till you know what it is. It happened while the occasional shrieks and dead flesh noises went on, all those near misses with my own death. I understood that I was crazy, crazy to be still alive, crazy to be doing what I was doing to stay alive, crazy to be trying to stay alive. This knowingness about Con was a strange island in a strange ocean. That sense of Con's presence, of his precise location, had undoubtedly saved my life several times in the carnage, if it hadn't done much for my sanity. But it meant that when things suddenly went quiet and I felt someone, some vampire, coming noiselessly up behind me, I knew it was Con. Well, well, said a silent voice from an invisible speaker. This meeting has been much more amusing than I anticipated. I didn't have to hear Con snort. He didn't, of course. Vampires don't snort, even with derision. But I knew as Con knew that the voice was lying when it said amusing. I also knew who this was. Bo Mr. Beauregard. The fellow who had got us in all this. The fellow we were here to have the final meeting with. Him or us. I was pretty sure things had only started to get amusing even if they hadn't gone quite as Bo had expected so far. And while I knew vampires didn't get tired, exactly, I knew that they could come to the end of their strength. I'd seen Con coming to the end of his, out at the lake. I didn't know how one evening of tearing up your fellow vampire's limb from limb matched against having been chained to the wall of a house with a ward sign eating into your ankle and the sun creeping after you through the windows every day, day after day, but I doubted Con was feeling bright-eyed and bushy tailed now. I sure wasn't. I was missing my nice sympathetic human emergency room tech saying, there's nothing really wrong with you, we're giving you a sedative and you can go home. I was also so tired that the weirdness of my dark vision was starting to bother me again, like new shoes that aren't quite broken in yet that you've been wearing too long. I couldn't tell how much of what I seemed to be seeing was happening, 
and how much of it was my overstressed brain playing tricks on my eyes. I stared around, trying to make sense of what I was, okay, not seeing, it was dark in here, wherever it was. When had it become in here? We'd started out on the streets of no town, more or less. Well, we weren't there anymore. Given the mess, I was glad no humans were likely to stumble across us. I tried to settle down, settle back into my skin except I didn't want to be in my skin anymore. I didn't want to be me. I didn't want to know me. But the animal body was overriding the conscious brain, the brain that ground out concepts like worthwhile and not worthwhile. My medulla oblongata was determined to stay alive, whatever my cerebrum said. For a moment I seemed to be floating up above myself, looking down at the bloody wreckage, at the two figures still standing, Con and me, standing next to each other, facing in the same direction. When Bo spoke again, I snapped back together, body and mind. I could almost hear the clunk, as the bolt slotted into place, trapping me with myself again. I may have hated and feared myself now, but I hated and feared Beauregard worse. Welcome, welcome. Do come in. Welcome between us, Connie, has been a curious affair for some years now, eh? I imagine you haven't been too surprised. Perhaps you explained it to your companion. I hope so, Connie. It would have been rude of you to omit explanation, I feel, and you have always been the soul of courtesy, haven't you? Your little human, Connie, is very enterprising. She has been nosing around me for some little while. I'm surprised, Connie, that you would allow a human to do your, shall I say, dirty work. You must have found your experience a few months ago more debilitating than I realized. Or perhaps more corrupting. And I had thought Con's laugh was horrible. I blanked out when Bo laughed, like you blank out when you're conked on the head. It's not a voluntary response. Maybe I should have been insulted that I was being ignored. I wasn't. I didn't want him to say anything to me. The mere experience, I won't call it sound, of his voice was like having the skin peeled off me, the skin I hadn't wanted to fit myself back inside a few moments ago. Very, very distantly it occurred to me that if I was feeling a little brighter I might find it funny that Bo seemed to be accusing me of being a bad influence on a vampire. But I wasn't feeling brighter. Oh yes, I am here, waiting for you. Do keep coming on. After all, you have worked quite hard to progress so far, have you not? It would be a pity to waste all that effort. And I really don't feel I could let you go now without paying your respects to me personally. It would be so rude. And wasn't I just saying, Connie, that you are the soul of courtesy? The voice itself was flaying me alive. What was left of my mind and will were addled with the effort to remain myself. Slowly, painfully, I moved my right hand, slid it stickily into my pocket, and closed my gummy and aching fingers around my little knife. It wasn't hot anymore, but the painful pressure of the voice eased a little. I dropped my eyes and through the smeary muck on my forearms I could see the occasional gleam of golden webbing. 
Do walk on. Please. That please seemed to last a century. Walking on being precisely what he was trying to prevent us from doing, by the non-sound of his voice. I squeezed my knife till I could feel it grinding into my palm, and took a step forward. So did Con. He didn't take my hand again, but as we moved, his shoulder brushed mine. I realized it was important not to appear to be struggling. Con could probably have moved faster without me, but he didn't, he waited. So I raised my other foot and took another step. And another. Con matched me, and with every step we touched, briefly, shoulder or arm or back of hand. There was a sort of quiver against my breast, as if the chain that hung there was rearranging itself. You must be tired, said the voice. You are walking so slowly. But I heard it too. He was losing this round, as he had lost the first one, because we weren't paralyzed and helpless. Because I wasn't dying under the scourge of his voice. I wondered how much worse it would be if he said my name. It became easier as we went on, he'd withdrawn, I guess, plotting his next move. We didn't get rushed by any minions trying to kill us either. I kept my hand wrapped around my knife, and I felt the little hard lump that was the seal against my other leg. The chain felt stretched across my breast like a rock climber spread-eagled across a particularly tricky slope. I pretended I was going forward bravely, ready for the next challenge. But I'd been wounded by that voice, the bitter burning of acid. My body throbbed with it, despite the talismans, despite the light web. Every step blew a little gust of pain through me. I tried not to shiver, which would only make it worse, and besides, pathetically, I didn't want Con to despise me. As our shoulders brushed, I felt him helping me, offering me his strength. I forgot again that he was a vampire, that I was afraid of him too, that I hated what he could do and had done, tonight, hated him for making me find out what I could do. He was also all I had. He was my ally and if I was going to let him down, which I probably was, at least let me not do it because I just lost it. The silvery luminescence that began eerily to come up around us was genuine light of some sort, light that a human I could respond to. But there was nothing here I wanted to see, that I wouldn't rather be able to trick myself into half believing I wasn't seeing that my human neurons were confused by the vampire thing I was infected with. We were in a huge room. There were enormous pipes, and the remains of scaffolding, and machinery, all round the walls, and more overhead. Some kind of derelict factory, no town was full of them. This one had been renovated, in a way, the sickly wash of marsh light gleamed off knobs and rivets, dials, and gadgetry that no human had ever invented, let alone put together. I wondered, dimly, if there was any purpose to them, or if they were merely backdrop, window dressing, the latest vampire version of Bram Stoker's febrile fantasy of ruined castles and earth-filled coffins. Big or important vampire gangs always had a headquarters, and headquarters usually contained some accommodations for those nights they wanted a change from eating out, and they felt like throwing a dinner party at home. 
Such a space would be suitably decorated to inspire further adrenaline panic in their visitors. And the word was that techno-degeneracy had been the staging of choice since the wars, although how anyone found this out to report it on the Globenet was a mystery. Stoker and his coffins had always been nonsense, but the vampires had borrowed the idea for a century or two as a Rousian scene because it worked. The lack of scarlet-lined black capes and funny accents tonight wasn't making me happy. I knew immediately that I didn't like techno-degeneracy either, but I wouldn't have liked their filled coffins any better. If there was any surprise, it was that I had any energy left to dislike anything. I was much better off disliking the decor and trying to convince myself I wasn't seeing it anyway. At the far end of the big room there was a dais, and on that dais sat Bo. I felt his eyes on me. Look at me, they said. It wasn't a voice this time, or even a compulsion, like the drag like a rope round my neck I had felt earlier. Not looking into his eyes felt like trying to prevent my heart from beating. But I didn't look, and my heart continued to beat. The dais was a tall one, and on the steps up to it lounged several more vampires. They were all watching us with interest. I could see the glitter of eyes. I wondered if vampire eyes really do glitter, or if it was something to do with the marsh light, or with my dark vision, or with the fact that I'd gone crazy and hadn't figured this out yet. So, okay, chances were I wasn't going to stay alive long enough to do any figuring, but I was still alive at the moment, and I was, it seemed ridiculous even as it occurred to me, but I was angry. I'd had my life ruined by this disgusting, undead monster. I had nothing to lose. All the best stuff in the books, and sometimes in history too gets done by people who have nothing left to lose and so aren't always looking over their shoulders for the way out after it was over. I thought, wistfully, that I'd rather be looking over my shoulder for the way out but I wasn't. I was about to die. But if I could take him. The bow thing, with me, it would have been worth it. The thought flamed up in me, like the sun coming up over the horizon. Yes. It will be worth it. I took my hand out of my pocket. Now all I had to do was do it. We reached the bottom of the dais. Those eyes were still pulling at me. Deliberately, consciously, voluntarily, I lifted my own eyes and met them. Monster didn't begin to cover it. Ironically the greeting we'd had from his guard corps had done me a service. I think if I hadn't already been shocked beyond my capacity to handle it I wouldn't have survived the initial blow of looking into the eyes of the master. Maybe it was a good thing I'd already lost my soul, that I was already half out of my body, my mind, my life. Because it meant I wasn't there to meet the full force of Bo's gaze. It was bad enough anyway. The distillation of hundreds of years of evil shimmering in those eyes, and his enjoyment of my looking at it. But he also expected me to crack, to disintegrate, immediately. He thought that as soon as I looked into his eyes it would be all over. Never mind that I could, apparently, look into ordinary vampires' eyes. That had happened occasionally. I saw this in his eyes too, and thought, it did. 
Remember this. The part of me that was looking forward to finishing dying said, What for? Bo was a master vampire. He could destroy vampires with his glare. A mere human would incinerate on the spot. Oh, and his eyes were colorless. Did I say that? I hadn't thought of evil as being without color but it is. Once you get past plain everyday wickedness, the color is squeezed right out of it. Evil is a kind of oblivion, having destroyed everything on its way there. I did go up in flames. But they weren't the flames he had anticipated. The light web blazed up, like a lit fuse running back to the detonator, the bomb, snaking along the ground as it had been laid out. A slender tongue of fire began in a curl on the back of each of my hands. They ran up my arms, licking along the lines of the lattice, across my breast, the chain around my neck flared into my scalp, I could feel my hair rising, waving in the fire, or perhaps it became fire itself, running down my back, my belly, my legs. The lighting of that fuse was looking into Bo's eyes. I was on fire. I put one flaming foot on the first stair of the dais, and stepped up. I was still staring into Bo's eyes. I felt, rather than saw, the vampires on the dais slither together and descend on Con. I don't know if they saw me burst into flames or not, I don't know if they were the sort of flames that anyone sees, even vampires. If they did see the light web ignite, presumably they thought it was to do with their master having me well in hand, and they could afford to concentrate on Con. But Bo gave me another gift, as I toiled up the dais stairs toward him, letting me see, briefly, out of his eyes, to the bottom of the dais, behind me. I saw the other vampires pull Con down. The vampires around Bo's dais would be the elite, of course, as the welcoming committee had been the cannon fodder, and as I say, I'm not sure that vampires get tired, exactly, but they can come to the end of their strength. I thought now, as I flamed, I seemed to hear the roaring of flame too, that Con might have given me more of his remaining strength than I had realized, to get me this far. More than he could spare. Which meant I had to. I saw one of the vampires bend over him, as they pinned him down, its mouth open, fangs shining, it buried its face in his throat. I saw him jerk and heave, but they had him fast. I saw another vampire delicately unbutton the remains of his shirt, stroke his chest. I saw its fingers reaching under Con's breastbone for his heart. It wasn't anything so clear and noble as a decision that since I could do nothing for him I might as well get on with what I was doing. That Con was dying in a good cause if I could finish it before I died too. It wasn't a meeting of my strength against Bo's either, because Bo was still the stronger. He was going to stop me before I reached him. I was two steps from the summit, the crown where Bo sat enthroned, and I couldn't go any farther. But I still couldn't watch Con die. I couldn't. Think about cinnamon rolls. Think about the bakery at Charlie's. Feel the dough under your hands and the heat of the ovens. Think about Charlie cranking down the awning, Mom going into the office and flicking on her combox before she takes off her coat. 
Think about Mel in the kitchen next door. Think about Pat and Jesse sitting at their table, eating everything that Mary puts in front of them. Think about Mary pouring hot coffee. Think about Mrs. Bialowski sitting at her table, and Maud sitting across from her. And for a moment I saw them, Mrs. B and Maud. They were holding hands across the table, and their faces looked haggard and strained and awful, as if they were waiting to hear the news of someone's death. News they were expecting. And then Mrs. B looked up, straight at me, as she had the day I had been watching her from behind the counter, and Maud looked up too, over her shoulder, as Mrs. B was looking. Their eyes met mine. Standing behind them I seemed to see Mel. He held out his arms toward me, and flames leaped from his skin, as if his tattoos were a light web. I took the last two steps. I was standing in front of Bo. But I couldn't bring myself to touch him, to try to touch him. I said that monster doesn't cover it. There is no word for a several hundred year old vampire who has performed every available wickedness over and over till he has to invent unavailable ones because he'd worn the others out. His flesh was not flesh, it was a viscous ooze, held together by malice. His voice was a manifestation of malignancy, for he had no tongue, no larynx, his eyes were the purest imagination of evil, flawless in a way that flesh could never be. I knew that if I touched him I would be recreated into such as he was. The scar on my breast burst apart, and my poisoned blood ran down. I stopped. I stopped trying. But Bo made a mistake. He laughed. I reached into my left-hand pocket and took out the daylight charm. I didn't look at it, but I felt the tiny sun spin and blaze, the tree shake its leaves, yes, the deer raise her head, acknowledging her own death, watching it come toward her. I felt the moving line of the water barrier around its edge. As Bo laughed, I threw the charm down the noisome hole that indicated his mouth. A little tracery of fire followed it, like an arrow carrying a rope across a chasm. The mouth hole closed with a sucking sound something an ear could hear. What there was that was left of him in the real world wavered and became vulnerable to reality again, as the force and concentration of his will faltered in surprise. Surprise and pain. The fire, my fire ran up his face, his eyes. No, no I can't say. But he had been strong and evil and undead for such a long time, and I had been alive and human for such a short time. My little fire wavered and began to ebb. His face writhed, he was about to speak.